Thank you everybody for being here. Um, to Welcome to our very first agriculture symposium hosted by IVCC Ag. Um, hopefully the first of many, but also hopefully the last virtual one that we ever have to hold. <laughs> that is the goal. Um, so before we get started, um, Mr. Mott and I would like to introduce ourselves to everybody here. So um, my name is Katherine Seabrook. I am one of the agriculture instructors and program co-coordinators here at, um, at IVCC. And I will turn it over to Willard to introduce himself as well. Okay, well, welcome everyone. Good evening. Thank you for joining us. And uh, my name is Willard Mott. I'm one of the agriculture instructors and program coordinators here. And, and I too agree with Catherine. Uh, we, we're just excited that we were able to host this this year, but also are looking forward to uh, the return of some in-person events, um, hopefully next academic year. So, um, so yeah, thank you for joining us and I'll let Catherine take the lead again from here. Thank you. Um, so before we actually truly get started, I do want to um, introduce everyone to Dr. Jerry Corcoran, who is the president of Illinois Valley Community College, um, and ask him to say some words of welcome for us. So Dr. Corcoran, whenever you're ready. I am ready, Catherine. Thanks very much for throwing me the ball. And, and thanks very much to you and Willard for all that you've done to really elevate the profile of our ag program. It's no secret to, to people that know me know that I was born and raised on a farm. I'm still calling in as a matter of fact tonight from that farm. And I couldn't be more proud of the job that Catherine and Willard have done to take our ag program from scratch to exactly where it is today. Um, and so I, it's met the, uh, the uh, guidance and the support of our board of trustees and our deans, uh, Ron Grolo and everybody could not be more proud of where we are and where we're going. So the vision looks great. My dad used to say, when you invest in high quality people, good things happen. And that's what we have with Willard Mott and Catherine Seabrook. So thanks for joining us, everybody, uh, for tonight's Ag Symposium. I'm looking forward to hearing from Dr. Matt Husband at Hudson. And I'm especially pleased and proud that Miriam Hoffman, one of our finest graduates, is here tonight as well. So thanks very much for being here. I'm looking forward to it like everybody else. Thank you, Dr. Corcoran. So the first thing that we're going to do is I'm going to share my screen to our, um, our brand new ag webpage where you can find any information that you want about IVCC ag. It's simply ivcc.edu slash agriculture. And there at the top of the page, you will find that we have our brand new recruitment video. So we're going to play that for you guys to kick things off. It's just about four minutes or so. Um, and then we'll get started with our speakers. So without further ado, here is our um, recruitment video, actually, one second here. Um, let me make sure that I share my sound with you guys because that would really help. <laughs> here we go. All right. Working on the farm's a job, but to me it really ain't a job because it's something that you enjoy. And I guess that's a good memo I could say to anybody. I mean, if you if you really enjoy what you do and you want to do a career that interests you, it's technically not a job. The ag program is a really good start to a career that's never going to end. Farming will always be around, and then the new ag program is helping students not only see that, but also getting them prepared. Upon graduation, you know, students are going to be looking for job opportunities, and, and the job opportunities in agriculture um, are, are just numerous. And specifically in our district, um, agriculture is one of the number one employers, one of the largest employers in the IVCC district, and, um, and actually throughout the state. And so when I think of the IVCC Ag program, and I think of the students that are involved um, in our program, what makes um, IVCC agriculture uh, different or unique, you know, one of the things that first comes to mind is our partnerships. One being a partnership that we have with AgView and Grain Co. FS called an Earn and Learn Opportunity, where students actually, they apply and upon acceptance to the program, they will get a full ride at IVCC that the companies will pay for, and they'll also get guaranteed employment with one of the companies after graduation as well. And on top of that, they can intern or work for the company during their time that they're in school as well. 
So one of the things that we realize is that the financial barrier to an education is a very, very large one. And we pride ourselves on being able to, our, to help our students with that. And we have over $50,000 in scholarships and they include both small scholarships that range from about you know, the $500 range up to a full ride scholarship for our students that covers books, tuition, fees, all of that. So it's really helpful to our students to be able to not have to worry about finances when they come to IVCC. So I received the Davis Family Agriculture Scholarship and it was, it was a huge benefit because then I can focus more on, you know, things like my classes and the Ag Club. The agriculture program here, not only is it really affordable for the education that you're getting, which, you know, is a big thing to think about when you are going to college, but also it's really just a great learning experience and there's so much more within it than you would think of. So really there's a place for everyone in here. It's just a great experience to come out and do the hands-on thing and I guess you could say farm somewhere else as in at the, at the college. It's kind of neat to be right at the college and doing what you do every day. So The instructors are the best of the best in my opinion. They've, they had their experiences personally like Mr. Mott farms, Ms. Seabrook's family farms and they're able to relate that to real world experience close as well as provide a learning experience. In a lab yesterday, we had a full conversation about soil conservation, tillage, no tillage, water standing, along with the lab that we were doing, which was water capability in soil. The Ag Club here is for both Ag students and students enrolled in IVCC as a whole. So anybody can join if you have an interest in agriculture. It's completely free. We do a lot of activities, a lot of events. So it's really good to get involved with everybody and get involved with agriculture more. Uh, it makes me feel really proud to be here at IVCC and to be helping to grow the agriculture program and provide um, our agriculture community with um, unique opportunities for students to get involved and then uh, take advantage of, of these careers that are available. So again, we want to provide more opportunities for those students. We want to, you know, find more internships for them, more job opportunities for them, more ways that they can find kind of, you know, find their niche in agriculture and find their passion in agriculture as well. From the day that I got here to where we are today, all I, I just feel a lot of pride. I feel that it's, it's grown significantly in a lot of different ways, both again in the number of students, in the opportunities that we can provide for them, in the equipment that we can provide for them to use as well. Agriculture is something that's always going to be around. There's always going to be some place in ag in the world. And it's important that we keep that going. We feed the world three times a day. All right, so like I said, that was our recruitment video. So we hope that gives you kind of a, a picture of what, what we do and who we are here at IVCC Ag. Um, and again, if you have any questions about the program, feel free to reach out to either Willard or myself. Um, you can find our contact information on the webpage. Um, and again, that webpage is simply ivcc.edu slash agriculture. Um, so I'm going to stop sharing my screen here and we are going to introduce the first speaker that is with us tonight. Um, which is Dr. Matt Hudson. Um, I'm gonna make you a co-host. You can share your screen with us. Um, so Dr. Hudson, um, I should say that I'm especially excited to introduce him because he is a professor um, in the University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign's um, Crop Sciences Department in the College of ACES. And I am an alum of the Crop Sciences Department. So very pleased to have you here with us, Dr. Hudson. Um, a little bit more about him, he is, um, He's the co-director and the co-founder of the Center for Digital Agriculture at UIUC. Um, he has helped develop and implement the Bachelor of Science degree in Computer Science plus Crop Sciences um, and is also an advisor for that program and teaches classes um, in that program as well. And on top of that, he currently leads the Center for Food System Security and is also a current and founding member of um, the AIF ARMS Institute, which is funded by the USDA um, and NIFA. So um, again, very pleased to introduce everybody to Dr. Matt Hudson. Um, Dr. Hudson, thank you so much for being here with us tonight and I will let you take it away whenever you're ready. Thank you very much. Um, we pronounced it AI farms, by the way, I thought. Oh, darn it. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so how do I share my screen here? Uh, there we go. Can you all see that? Yes. Okay. 
So I'm just going to take uh, 20, 25 minutes to talk to you about our digital agriculture programs. Um, hopefully I won't go too far over time, but stop me if I get a little over enthusiastic here because there's a lot to talk about. Um, so in the crop sciences department, you know, data wasn't always a big deal. So um, here's some of our uh, intrepid researchers from the, the early 20th century out on the Morrow plots in their bowler hats and their suits. And back then, um, agriculture was, agricultural research was a lot of work um, for a few data points, right? So you you'd dig holes, you'd take soil cores, you'd look at things down microscopes, you'd measure plant yields once a year, and you'd write that down in a logbook, and you'd do calculations on it by hand, but doing the calculations wasn't a very big part of the work. And that was still true until relatively recently. We had more sophisticated methods for data gathering, but still most of the work was generating the data and not analyzing it. And until recently, you know, uh, most of our students were still doing most of their measurements by hand. And, and we still do a lot of this because it's necessary to make sure that all of our machines are giving us the right answers. Um, but in the last few years, we've got so many more sources of big data. And uh, most of these are increasingly impactful in agriculture. Um, so some of the most obvious ones include weather models, climate models, and uh, aerial imaging, um, which are influencing all kinds of uh, areas of agriculture and land use in, in many ways, um, immediately from, from individual farmers through to sort of global policy issues. But also farmers, even in the third world, often have a handheld device that has fast access to the internet now. And that's increasingly changing agriculture internationally as well as domestically. And devices like drones and genome sequencers are increasingly throwing huge amounts of data into the laps of us crop science researchers who haven't traditionally been a data-driven subject. So fields like astronomy or computer science or particle physics have been dealing with this data deluge for a long time, it's arguably even more of a big deal right now in agricultural research, and not just agricultural research, but, but practice and uh, the development in large companies are increasingly computerized, and we need better and faster ways to analyze the data. So, in my field, which is essentially plant breeding and genetics, um, there are, we, we've had this revolution with genomics and, and weather models and aerial imaging. And now we have all these new technologies such as um, gantries and drones measuring phenotypes of plants and increasingly also robots. Um, Dr. Hudson, can I interrupt you for Sorry, a second? Go ahead. Have you been advancing your slides? Because it looks like we can still only see the main screen. Uh oh, I've, I've been advancing a lot of slides. My uh -oh. <laughs> screen sharing is paused, it says. Um, I don't know how it got paused. Oh, there we okay. go. There's been a lot of slides. Uh, let me let me wind them back for you. Um, uh, okay, so this is this is us in our bowler hats on the Morrow plots. Um, this is us now in the field. Um, this is the data types that I'm talking about. And here's the new technologies that in my field are starting to revolutionize data collection. And these include um, these giant machines like, like gantries and um, you know, light aircraft imaging, which is increasingly data dense, but also drones and robots on the ground as well as robots in the air. And those kinds of technologies are changing very, very quickly in ways that are affecting everything we do, but are hard to predict. And when you actually think about the data coming off some of these new technologies and what that means in the terms we used to think about data is quite astonishing. So um, genomics, um, for example, creates terabytes of data per plant. So that's, 
um, when you think about a field of plants, that's a university library, right? If you start putting cameras and uh, LIDAR images on planters and sprayers and collecting video from them, we're talking about petabytes per relatively small region like a county. So if all the farmers start putting these kinds of imaging devices onto their machines and collecting the data, the data that we're talking about is in the range of all the data in all US academic libraries per county. When we start thinking about weather and climate models, those are similar in size now, although they are at least centrally held on supercomputers. Um, but when we start thinking about collecting all that image data from machines and remote sensing, aircraft, drones, that if it becomes as dense as every large farm having that kind of equipment, we're talking about petabytes or exabytes. Now we have equipment at the university now that can store exabytes. It doesn't sound like a huge amount, but to put that into perspective, and about five exabytes is about every word spoken by every human being that ever lived. So we, we, we deal now with these um, thousand fold increases in computer power and data from gigabytes to terabytes to petabytes to exabytes without really thinking about what that means. But in human terms, these quantities of data are truly unmanageable. So what are we doing about managing this? Well, one of the things that we have done is to get this grant to found the AI Farms Institute, which is a USDA NIFA grant. And the idea of AI, artificial intelligence in agriculture is increasingly that we are gonna use artificial intelligence, many artificial intelligences in computers to try to replace those brains that would sit all winter in their office while they couldn't do experiments thinking about how to analyze their data. And how do you implement these kinds of things? Well, A, we have a large collaboration um, it includes the Donald Danforth Center, who operate the gantry I showed you in Arizona, as well as uh, Argonne National Lab, University of Chicago, Tuskegee. So it's an alliance between traditional agricultural powers, such as ARS or Michigan State or Tuskegee, with um, places like Argonne National Lab that do um, things that aren't normally connected with agriculture. But we're talking about putting intelligent sensors on, over, and under fields, and then using that data immediately to make decisions. But in my field, we also have a lot of data issues. So we do genomics. Um, we ge sequence genomes, you know, soybean genomes done. Uh, the corn genome is completed. And we have a, um, a problem in that uh, now we have a different genome for every, every plant we want to breed in every population. Um, so yes, we got those genomes done, they were very useful, but now we need to make those kinds of decisions based on these huge genome data sets for individual breeding crosses. And so implementing AI for making decisions in, in plant breeding and genetics is increasingly important and necessary. Um, this kind of AI is what we call narrow or weak AI in computer science. So in other words, that um, type of uh, decision-making is, is pretty straightforward. It's like, which plant should I use? Or should the car break here or not break? Um, it's not the kind of AI that can actually you know, talk back to you and have a conversation that resembles a conversation with a human. We're talking about decision-making aids and, and the medical community sometimes call this um, guided AI or um, augmented human intelligence because they like to think that um, doctors are still ultimately making the diagnosis and the decision. And that's what's happening in agriculture too. It's just the scientists can't handle and think about the data flows that are involved. Um, another big part of the uh, project is the autonomous farm, um, which is on the South Farms of the University of Illinois. And 
Um, we have a, one of our participating faculty has developed a robot, which he's actually spun out a startup company called Terracentia that makes. Um, we also have this uh, access to the, the field scanner I mentioned before. And the idea is that we will have um, robots within fields, small robots under the canopy that can drive between rows of crops. And those cr robots will be collecting high definition video in real time and all kinds of other data, far too much data to handle. But they are connected via their own internet of things to one another and to coordinating computers in the field. And artificial intelligence algorithms will process those huge amounts of data in the field such that this huge stream of video is converted into a relatively small number of manageable data points that are useful to, for example, a, a crop breeder or a farmer. Um, there's already some evidence that, you know, at least on small research plots, managing these rows by robots, doing things like weeding and other tasks by robotics, as well as those kinds of tasks I showed students doing earlier in collection of, of data about crops, can really increase the amount of uh, value that we get out of a, an acre and reduce the environmental input, as well as, as um, pushing the technology forward in, in robotics and AI. So let's see if this works. There should be a video. There we go. So one of the issues here is what we call machine vision. So that robot's got a camera and it's taking video. But how does it know what it's looking at? So on board the robot is a set of AI algorithms that tell it which part of the crop it's looking at. You can see there that there were boxes. I'm going to play it again. It puts little boxes around the ears, right? So it's measuring ear size in a, in a cornrow. Um, it knows what a stalk is, and it's measuring the height between internodes, and it knows what an ear is, and it can estimate ear height and ear number from the ground. And so it doesn't need to send us this huge amount of video data it's collecting. What we're interested in is how long the internodes are in the crop and how many ears there are and how big they are. And so it can send us just that information, and that greatly reduces the need for supercomputers and bandwidth and all these other kinds of things we talk about a lot. Oops, sorry. So I was trying to stop the video and I stopped sharing there. Let me try again. So, okay, next, next, next. There we go. Okay, so I, I do tend to go on a little bit about crops. I love crops, I love plants, that's what I do. Um, but for those of you who are interested in animal agriculture, we also have an equally large effort in, in animal ag. The applications of AI and automation in animal agriculture have been a little more limited, and there's a couple of reasons for that, but we're aiming to change that. One of our key goals is to use the same kind of AI video recognition rather than using it to recognize parts of plants from a moving robot or a moving drone. We want to use it to recognize what an animal is actually, um, what its condition is, whether it's stressed, um, whether its pen is dirty, um, whether it's showing signs of any problems such as dehydration. And this is an a more challenging problem than a plant, right? Because animals move around, they all look different, they all behave differently. Um, a human can recognize, you know, relatively easily from a video of a pig, whether that pig is exhibiting stress behavior or not. But it's a challenge for an AI algorithm on a camera in the pen to be able to um, recognize whether um, the animal is showing signs of stress behavior of one type or another. The idea here, again, is we're not going to stream the video to some room in, in the farm where there's going to be you know, hundreds of screens, nobody can cope with that data. What we want is an AI algorithm that can watch the animal and just sound a simple alarm when there are signs of stress in that particular pen. So this is what I mean by taking that huge flow of data and channeling it into something that is humanly manageable. Um, so I hope I've given you a little bit of a flavor of, you know, what the applications of, of data and 
AI and computer science are in, in my field and some other fields of agriculture. Um, the point and the, the real reason for this talk is there are enormous opportunities for um, ag data professionals. There's a lot of jobs out there, as, as Will had mentioned in his, his video, for agriculture professionals. You know, we're short of agriculture professionals. There's an enormous number of jobs out there for computer science and data professionals too. But if you combine those two, the opportunities are quite incredible. And this is gonna be a huge growth area in the next um, 10, 20 years, I think, continuing for a long period. Um, we need to take not only the AI that's used, being used to aid farmers and breeders, but also there's all those wireless subscribers out there um, that can be connected to their food supply and find out where their food's coming from and maybe have their food security enhanced by this kind of technology. So a lot of the things we're looking at now don't just directly reflect to the traditional field agricultural research that most of us are involved in, but they also relate to how farms and consumers are connected to one another and to the rest of the economy. So partly to reflect this, um, computer science has started creating um, joint degrees with other departments because increasingly um, we're all doing a lot of computer science regardless of our academic field. And one example of this, one of the early examples of this was we created a joint degree with uh, computer science and crop science, a joint bachelor of science degree. And it contains the serious core of both disciplines. So you do serious computer science with the computer science students as well as serious crop science. Um, not everyone can, can get into that program because you have to meet the admissions requirements for the Illinois Computer Science Department. So um, we're also uh, developing, and this is being led by uh, Tiffany at uh, Computer Science, her name will come back to me, I'm sorry. Um, but uh, we've got a new professor in, uh, in Computer Science who's um, running what she calls the ICANN program. And this stands for Illinois Computing Accelerator for Non-Specialists. So this is a way into computer science if you've maybe never taken all those introductory C++ programming courses and now it's all Dutch to you as it is to many of us and it, and it was to me to be honest for quite a bit of my career. Um, so that ICANN program is an online program that allows people who've missed out on computer science to get up to speed to, to, to take the rest of the classes. Um, we have a master's of engineering degree forthcoming in digital agriculture, which will be higher level grad classes in computer science and crop science, but aimed specifically at the practicalities of this upcoming opportunity in digital agriculture and AI. And we have a number of forthcoming degree majors that I'll mention quickly. We also have certificate courses, um, which some of which are already available, but many of them are, are in the pipe. So um, here's some uh, websites that uh, might uh, help if you need more information about the Institute or um, the computer science crop science degree. But I'm just gonna briefly mention a little more about that computer science crop science degree because that's been one of the things that surprised people the most. So um, Illinois is the only university as far as I know that is top ranked in both computer science and crop science. So, or and agriculture. So if you're gonna do both of them to a graduate level, a higher level, we think we're one of the best places to do it. It's a joint degree offered by the CS and crop science departments. Uh, students pay tuition at the computer science rate and you do cores of both disciplines with, with nothing really missed out. There's a lot of required classes. Um, there are different tracks, so there's a track for technical specialists, such as the people who are actually gonna go into AI programming of robots to take more CS. And there's a couple tracks within, or types of tracks within crop sciences where you can specialize in things like biotechnology also. Um, 
there is um, a lot of required classes because you also have to take all of the key crop science classes, the genetics, the breeding, the entomology, the weed science, um, and three math courses and stats. So it's, it's not for the faint of heart. Um, but we are um, trying to expand this program a lot. And when we told um, Climate Corporation buyer about this, they said that we'll give you $10,000 for every student who takes that degree program. So there is a guaranteed $10,000 scholarship from buyer for every student in that. Um, there's an additional 10,000 available to outstanding students, which to be honest, nearly everyone we've got so far has been outstanding. So there's, there's been $20,000 going to each student in that program. Um, there's other department scholarships too, actually. So it's fairly well supported, even though Illinois tuition isn't the cheapest. Um, if you transfer in, it's a shorter program and you'll get a lot of help with that. Um, we also have MS, as well as the MS degree in precision agri uh, digital agriculture I mentioned, there's also a forthcoming BS program in precision ag. Um, that's gonna be more oriented towards the ag engineering side of things. So I didn't talk as much about precision ag, precision planting, um, decision agriculture, and those aspects. Um, that's not my specialist field. Um, but we do have a lot of experts in, in those areas of, of automation and precision in, in agricultural machinery as well. And increasingly, we're also providing a lot of on-the-job training programs from a number of certificate programs that are short and um, easily accessed, maybe uh, four to eight credit hours being the smaller ones, and that can be taken asynchronously online in the evenings or whenever you have time. Um, through to um, the master's degree in crop science, which is an increasingly high precision ag content, which is also an online distance learning. Currently, it's a synchronous degree, so you have to be in class at a specific time. But we're working to get more and more of that program also asynchronous, so that when people go back to work and they actually have to be at work nine to five, um, I know a lot of us already have to be there, but we're, increasing, we're anticipating increased demand um, for these asynchronous classes going forward. And um, the nice thing about crop sciences is, is also that there's a lot of faculty, it's a very research heavy department. We don't have that many students. So the faculty are very available to students um, compared to some other subjects. And it's very unusual to combine some of the things that um, the uh, crop science faculty do. Um, I, I happened to tell a journalist that I was doing a degree on crop science and computer science, and they, they put me on the front page of the News Gazette because they thought that was so weird. Um, so, um, but it really is uh, because that opportunity is new and it's not something people think about. It's something that um, future generations should seriously consider for training. And I'm gonna leave it there. I think I've used my 25 minutes and take questions. Thank you, Dr. Hudson. So does anybody have any questions? You can unmute yourself or you can put it in the chat as well. I'll ask one here. Dr. Hudson, um, I recently visited with a local um, farmer cattle producer who said that other countries were maybe a little bit leaps and bounds ahead of us in terms of connecting the food at the grocery store. Maybe you can scan it with a phone and know exactly which farm it was produced on. Is that a direction you think we're headed or are we there and I'm not aware of it? No, I, I agree. There's a lot of barriers to that here. And some of them are, some of them are due to the way we did things in the past to make agriculture more efficient, right? So all of the commoditization, all of the system for, you know, a pork belly is a pork belly, a soybean is a soybean, and it's all traded through Chicago. So that makes it very difficult to trace stuff. Um, other countries didn't have such an integrated ag and commodity system. So it made it a little easier for them to leapfrog to this next step of, you know, exactly where your food comes from. It's true that, you know, in some West Coast areas, there are definitely ways to do that for sure. Um, but it obviously adds to the cost of the product. Right. So it's not not everyone can afford it. Um, we are looking increasingly for some pro some products, things like you know meat in particular, 
that that traceability is increasingly necessary because if you have you know a, a, a food poisoning outbreak you want to be able to very quickly trace it and you want to be able to very re quickly recall everything that that came from the same line at the same time but you don't want to have to do these massive recalls that we have at the moment where, where every bag of spinach sold in the country for the last week has to go in the trash right so we want to be more specific with those recalls where there's a food poisoning problem, we want to be able to target it. We want to be able to say, okay, scan your QR code on your product and we will trace exactly what plant that was made in at what time and whether it's one of the problems. And then relatively few people will have to throw their food in the trash, will waste less food, and we'll also accelerate the system and add, add value down the chain. So those kinds of technologies are coming and the, actually, a lot of it requires, um, so it's, you can centrally manage it, right? You can have a computer in some government office that traces every part of food and where it comes from and where it goes to. That's not the way the USA usually does things. So um, what we're looking at here is increasingly the use of blockchain technology to provide unique traceable blockchain identifiers to every food product. So essentially every food product has a has a verified blockchain attached to it through each chain of custody that is traceable right back to exactly every step that went through from its departure from the farm and that will presumably be able to add value because people will be able to validate things like sustainability of their food and um, different aspects of you know whether the the food meets the criteria they want to they want for it but it's also a um like i said a, a great food safety mechanism and it's also a, a a useful measure for food security because if we know where all those food products are and we know they're about to expire and we know they haven't been sold yet and we know the food banks need them then we can connect food banks with unexpired high quality food that's otherwise going to get thrown away tomorrow. So I, I see a lot of uses of this technology that haven't fully been realized, but are coming, I think, in the next few years. Did that answer your question? Yes, thank you. Dr. Hudson, this is all very interesting to me. Um, so my question is relating to the, the scale required um, in order for some of these AI new technologies to be viable on operations. So right now there's a lot of consolidation happening in farms, but there's also a lot of an increased interest in localization and smaller operations. So do you see AI technology as at some point in the future having a place on all sizes of farms, or do you think it's something that's going to stay with large scale operations? Thank you. That was a good question. Um, I'm imagining a little bit of both, right? So when these technologies first come out, they're probably going to be expensive. They're probably going to be in a great big box that costs a lot of money. And probably the larger operations are going to be ones that implement them first. But what tends to happen with computer algorithms is the algorithms themselves become more and more efficient and the hardware that they run on becomes faster and faster, and the networks they communicate on become faster and faster. So that what's in a big box that costs $100,000 today often is just an app that your phone can run alongside everything else in five, 10 years. So that's what I anticipate is gonna happen here. So you'll get early adopters, and a lot of them are gonna be the spendy big producers who want the solution now. Um, but as long as the technology is managed in a way that doesn't give certain people a monopoly, it should be able to spread down the chain all the way down to third world subsistence farmers. And we're actually seeing already that, you know, there's also some applications that you don't need if, you, if you're running a, a 5,000 acre corn soybean operation that might be very valuable to say a, a subsistence farmer in Africa. So one of them is, and I never knew about this, there's a problem in Africa with counterfeit fertilizer. So um, there's folks out there selling bags that say fertilizer on them and it's not fertilizer. You know, it's, it's rock salt or chemical waste or whatever they could get off that, that looks vaguely like fertilizer, sand. 
you know, and the farmers are not sufficiently aware because they they can only just be being able to get and afford fertilizer what fertilizer actually looks like, you know, so they they don't necessarily even know that it should be sort of little spherical granules about, you know, three to five millimeters. Um, and one of the things that one of our professors has done is create an app. And so the farmers may not have seen a lot of fertilizer before, but they have smartphones. And she's created a machine vision app that you can point at fertilizer and it'll tell you whether it's fertilizer or not. And it may basically just looks at grain size and reflectivity and a couple of other things. And it will spot 95 to 99% of the cases of counterfeit fertilizer that we've seen. And it greatly increases the, the confidence the farmers have in, in what they're buying. So I, I do think there's gonna be benefits everywhere from this. There's also some risks in privacy and other things, but I, I see a lot of good could be done through this. It's very interesting, thank you. All right, so I think what we're going to do now is we are going to switch over to our little kind of miniature um, intermission here and it's hosted by our IVCC Ag Club. So we have here with us tonight, um, Allison and Taylor. Um, and so they are going to share some slides with us. They have some um, some ag trivia and how this is going to work is it's going to be um, more interactive than competitive. So we'd like you guys to answer the questions in the chat box um, as they come up. And what we'll do is at the end, they will take um, a tally of who all answered questions, put your names in a hat, and then we'll draw, uh, I think about three. Um, and then we'll email the winners and ask you guys whether you want uh, an IVCC ag t-shirt or a hat. Um, so without further ado, I'm going to let Allison and Taylor um, take over here. And Allison, I have made you a co-host. You can share your slides. Can everybody see that? Yes. Okay, great. So yeah, just um, drop them down in the chat box and we'll go from there. Okay. Okay, so I guess we'll oh, come on. We can see your screen, okay, Allison. Oh, there we go. It wouldn't let me move slides. Okay, so. Okay, so um, do we all know what most hay is used for production wise? I can see a couple answers in here. Everybody got their best guess? The answer to that is gonna be animal feed. So we had Carrie was right, Miriam was right. Okay, um, does anybody know the state soil of Illinois? Okay. 
That's a tough one, Allison. I put some interesting ones in here. Everybody got their guesses in? I see a couple close ones in here. So the answer to this is gonna be the drummer, Silty Clay Long. So um, Russ had drummer, we got one that had clay, and we have a loam in here. Okay. Which of the following are forms of primary tillage? A, field cultivating, B, chiseling, C, rotary hoeing, D, inline ripping. Anybody else got any guesses? Okay, so the answers are going to be B, chiseling, and D, inline ripping. You were close, Mario. Which breed of dairy cattle produces the most milk in the U.S. industry? Anybody else got any guesses? I like your strategy, Jane. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, so the answer for that is gonna be the Holstein, whether it be the black or the red Holstein. Who is the inventor of the steel plow? The answer to this one is gonna be John Deere. So they weren't known for their original tractors. They originally made steel plows. Which of the following is a broadleaf plant? A, field corn, B, canola, C, wheat, D, oats.
So the answer to that is going to be canola fields, which is not something you usually see around here, but figured soybeans would give it away. Well, that's all I had for trivia. So I'll go ahead and stop sharing my screen. Awesome. Thanks, Allison. And thank you to you and Taylor for getting that put together. Um, so we are going to go ahead and move on to our next speaker that I believe uh, Willard is going to introduce for us. Absolutely. It is my pleasure to introduce to everyone our final keynote speaker, IBCC Ag alumna Miriam Hoffman of Earlville, Illinois, and the Earlville FFA chapter. Miriam served as the 2018-2019 Illinois FFA State Secretary and is currently serving as the National FFA Eastern Region Vice President. She is currently a junior at Southern Illinois University Carbondale studying agribusiness economics. Miriam grew up on her family farm outside of Earlville where she developed a passion for agriculture and love for the FFA. As a national officer, Miriam says that her aim for the year is to empower students and the organization to embrace complexity. Please help me welcome our keynote speaker, Miriam Hoffman, to give her speech titled, Don't Let the World Happen to You, How to Turn Disruption into Innovation. Miriam Hoffman, everyone. Well, thank you so much, Mr. Mott. It's so good to be here uh, virtually, but it's, it's great to see so many familiar faces. And I definitely would not be in the role that I'm at, wouldn't be in this office here today if it wasn't for all the great support I've had from IBCC, um, from Dr. Corcoran and, and the board there, and of course, Mr. Mott and Mrs. Seabrook as well. And got to give some credit to my family as well. My older sister, Martha, um, definitely, she set me on the path in FFA and she left some big shoes to fill when I went to IBCC as well. But as Mr. Mott said, my name is Miriam, serving as the National FFA Eastern Region Vice President this year. And in my role, I get to advocate for the organization and serve as a face of our over 760,000 student members across the nation and in Puerto Rico. And so the last five and a half months since I've been elected, my year is almost half over, which is crazy. Um, but I've been doing quite a bit of training. The first few months was training and finishing up the semester at Carbondale. And then this spring semester and in the fall, I will be taking a gap year from, from school just to, to serve full time for the FFA, but doing some training. And then February, my teammates and I were doing chapter visits virtually across the country during FFA week. We visited over a hundred different chapters and states across the country. And, and so even though we haven't been able to do much traveling yet, we've been able to connect with a lot of different students and we've been doing some virtual sponsor visits as well with a lot of our really generous corporate sponsors. Um, and it's, it's been a great opportunity to advocate for the organization that I love so much and also for the industry that I love. Because at the end of the day, FFA, we teach leadership, but we teach it through agriculture. And so it's, it's great to be here celebrating agriculture and innovation is one of my core values. Um, and innovation in agriculture is one of my favorite things to talk about. So I certainly don't have as much technical expertise um, as, as Dr. Hudson or any of the, the professors here today. Um, but, but what I do have is I've had a chance to interact with a lot of different people and observe a lot of different things that are happening in the industry and that are happening in the area of leadership and personal growth. And something that's been on my mind quite a bit is the idea of disruption and innovation. Um, and so when, when Mr. Mott asked me to speak, he wanted me to talk about agriculture and also about how to, how to stay motivated to, to achieve our goals in a pandemic. And I think those things kind of fit together actually in the concept of disruption and innovation. Um, but whenever I, I get a chance to, to talk about agriculture, I always go back to, to my roots on my family's farm. And growing up, my big sister Martha and I were showing cattle at county fairs across the northern part of the state. And our older brothers were the ones that really made that possible for us. They hauled the cattle to the shows and a lot of times they do quite a bit of the work. And then my sister and I would get to, to show our calves in the show ring. But there was one summer, I wanna say I was about nine years old. And our brothers told us that they didn't really wanna show anymore. They were about to be done with college and they were kind of moving on with their lives. And my sister and I faced a point where we could either just accept the fact that we didn't get to show cattle anymore or we could step up to the plate 
and, and make something happen. And so that's when we decided we put our heads together and said, you know, we can, we can show cattle without our brothers. Like we, we just need them to drive the cattle to the fair and we can take it from there. And so that was the point that, that I, I started to learn about what it looked like to take something that was kind of a disruption and then turn it into a chance to, to build something new uh, for myself. And so my sister and I really took, took the, the show, um, the, the show string and, and made it our own. And so that was, that was a pretty cool opportunity um, at, at such a young age to, to realize what it looks like to take the things that the world throws at us um, and, and to turn it into something that, that we wanted. And so as I've, I've been able to do some virtual sponsor visits, like I mentioned, interacting with some pretty high level executives in different companies. And, and one of the things we talk about a lot is innovation and how companies are approaching innovation right now. Um, I actually just had a meeting earlier today with Syngenta's global head of biologicals, and we were talking about how much industry has shifted and how much so many companies are now looking to, to startups and to those entrepreneurial people who are building the technology and then the larger corporations have the resources to take that technology and, and do something with it and to really scale it up. But when you look at the definition of, of disruption, it's disturbance or problems which interrupt an activity, event, or process, whereas innovation is to make changes in something established by introducing something new. And when I was kind of looking at these definitions, it, it stuck out to me that they're basically the same thing, but disruption is something that happens to us, and innovation is something that happens because of us. And so when we look at things that happen in the world, we look at things that are happening in agriculture, a lot of times like something shows up that's unexpected. And then we have a chance to, to either just accept that and let it happen to us, or we could turn that around and say, no, I'm actually gonna do something to build something new because of this and to turn it around into something positive. And so that's something that I've seen a lot in the agriculture industry. And whether it's something like weather that, that happens every day, <laughs> or it's things like consumer trends. Um, we're seeing agriculture is constantly being disrupted, but that also means we constantly have an opportunity to innovate. And there's quite a few different um, studies that have looked at consumer interests and shifting, shifting demand when it comes to what our consumers want. But I found this one study that, that mentioned it was just released a couple months ago and they found over 80% of consumers consider something like sustainability in their purchasing decisions. And sustainability doesn't really have a, a solid definition right now. Um, it, it means something different to everyone, but just the general concept of are we taking care of our environment um, and ensuring that we can continue farming on into the future. Over 50% are more concerned about sustainability now than they were just a year ago. I think we saw a lot of, of the pandemic um, is, is what influenced a lot more consumers. Already consumers were starting to think more about where the food came from, but the pandemic really brought to, to the forefront of our minds about the, the fragility of our food system. Um, super efficient as, as Dr. Hudson was saying, but, but there are some aspects that we lacked some resilience. And we're looking at mostly millennials, ages 18 to 44 are the most interested in sustainability. And that's one of the largest portions of, of market share when it comes to consumers. So obviously sustainability is something that consumers are thinking about. And I heard a keynote speaker last week, I was at Wyoming's in-person FFA state convention. There was a keynote speaker there, an ag economist. And he said that you know, we, we sometimes have this, this phrase that we say, like, if you ate today, thank a farmer. Um, but he kind of flipped it. He said, if you farm today, thank a consumer. And I really like that because I think when we can sometimes get stuck in our little like silo of, you know, like I farm and I want to do what I want to do. But then we look at the other side and it's, well, we get to do what we do on the farm because of the consumers who are, are out there actually purchasing the product of our toil. So when we look at this, it's kind of a disruption. The consumers are coming and asking us, to do things differently sometimes. And we can look at that as, as something that's in our way or we can look at that as an opportunity. And when we think about sustainability, there's a lot of times three pillars that we talk about. We look at you know, the, the social sustainability, we look at environmental impact, um, and then we also look at economic impact. And as an econ major, that's kind of my favorite piece <laughs> to talk about. And I think that's a lot of times the, the foundational one that farmers are looking at because at the end of the day, our farms are businesses. And so thinking about how do we turn this, this disruption into an innovation, I think we're seeing that there are ways to create win-win solutions in which 
we, we produce the kind of food that our consumers want to continue to buy, uh, but we're also maintaining economic sustainability and really that resilience that we wanna see in our, in our agriculture industry and on our farms as well. So last summer, I had a really cool opportunity to intern with a company called Continuum Ag based out of Washington, Iowa. It's an ag tech startup company. Um, my boss started it when he was in college um, just a few years ago and we focused on soil health data. And we also did a lot of like in-field trials. I got to spend quite a bit of my time out in the fields last summers and last summer and I, I loved, loved the chance that I had to be out there. But one of the ways that a lot of farmers are approaching this disruption and turning it into innovation is through different practices. And so this is just a few pictures of, of some of the practices that my boss was, was experimenting with out there in Iowa and he was really, really focused on collecting data on it. So looking at, you know, what are the soil tests looking like? And at the end of the day, what's, what's the effect on yield? But then ultimately what's the effect on profitability? Because sometimes we can get distracted with yield and we forget that profitability doesn't always correlate with yield because we got to look at those, those input costs and, and the long-term impacts of, of our practices. So this picture up in the top left, um, that was some, some relay cropping that we did. So that was planting rye in the fall and then coming in in the spring, drilling soybeans into the rye and then coming harvesting the rye over the top of the soybeans um, in July when it, when it was ripe. And then we'd come back and harvest the soybeans in the fall. And what my boss found was that there was very little yield drag on the soybeans. And then he also had some pretty decent yield on the cereal rye that he went and turned around and, and used that for his own seed for cover cropping. Um, so that was a, a really cool way. I, I loved watching the relay crop and it was, it's always kind of cool to see like different crops growing at the same time. And just the idea that like those different plants growing together, how that can build up the soil health um, and how it can, can still maintain economic profitability. Um, and that was some of the most profitable acres on the farm was that relay crop. Um, up in the top right, that, that photo is, um, he experimented a little bit with some 60 inch corn um, and it was like a plant two, skip one. So there'd be two rows that were 30 inches and then there'd be a 60 inch gap. And then we interseeded cover crop into that gap um, right around like middle of June. Um, and so there's, I believe those are some some brassicas that, that were there. Um, but then that, that cover crop had a head start instead of waiting until after harvest um, to seed that in. Um, and then one of the other things that my boss and some of his some of the farmers in his network um, are also doing is, is looking at different crops to grow. I know um, canola was on one of the, the questions earlier. Um, and that's, that's one that I know my brother's experimenting with some canola this year actually on our, our farm back home, but um, my boss grew some barley for a, a local microbrewery. And so there's a lot of kind of these like niche markets that farmers are finding that they can grow alternative crops um, and still, still make some pretty good money on those as well. And then we're also seeing that um, similar to a, a lot of what Dr. Hudson was talking about. There's a lot of innovations when it come to, comes to like technology and, and precision ag ways that we can, can reduce our inputs and, and so we can reduce our environmental externalities and reduce those impacts while also saving money on the farm as well. And, and one of the other ways, it's not just about like actually doing the practices, but we got to figure out like how, how do we do them? Because there are ways to do them right and there are ways that don't work quite as well. And some of that has to come through personal experience. Every farm is different. A lot of times we, we got to figure out what's going to work for us. But one of the, the best ways to learn how to make these things happen is, is to build networks and, and find people out there who want to help us. Um, and that's something that I've found abundantly there at IBCC, um, as well as in the FFA and really in the ag industry in general. Most people want to help each other. And in this space, within some of these really innovative farmers who are thinking about soil health in a different way and who are thinking about innovation beyond, beyond technology, but also thinking about how can we work with, work with the soil and with, the, with nature. Um, there's a lot of farmers that are, are very supportive and will host field days um, and will share everything that they know. So this is just a picture of me. Um, I got some uh, hairy vetch there um, in, in the field last spring. And then at, at a field day, I got to help out with last August over in Indiana um, with Rick Clark is one of, one of the leading farmers um, in this space. And he's 
just invites people to his farm and, and wants to teach them everything that he's found that works for him. And, and the other thing about these practices is that not everything works the same on everybody's farm. And so the bigger that, that you can build your network, then the more that, that you can find people who have similar, similar situations to you who can help you figure out what works. And kind of going along with the idea of, of building networks to help us learn how to innovate. Um, I, I consume a lot of content when it comes to podcasts and email newsletters. Um, and that's another great way to, to build our networks. And so these are a couple of my favorite ones, Future of Agriculture with Tim Hamerich. Um, he talks a lot about ag tech. Um, it's kind of his, his personal favorite thing. He's kind of an ag nerd um, like myself. So I really enjoy listening to, to his podcast and he covers a lot of diverse perspectives too. Um, which is something that's important when we're thinking about how to innovate. And then the Fieldwork podcast, um, my boss from last summer, Mitchell Hora, um, co-hosts that with the Minnesota millennial farmer, Zach Johnson. Um, and they're talking about what do, what does conservation agriculture look like? What do sustainable agriculture practices look like actually on the farm? Um, and Zach Johnson is, is from up in Minnesota and cover cropping is pretty hard that far north. And so he's really honest about the struggles that he's had with it. Um, and they also have some, some pretty cool guests. They talk about policy. They talk about um, a lot of people working for NRCS in, in conservation roles like that. But again, a lot of really diverse perspectives there um, that, that add value to the conversation. So kind of um, shifting a little bit away from agriculture, there's, <laughs> there's a pandemic, right? And I think we can all agree that was a pretty massive disruption in all of our lives in, in some form or another. But what I've been really impressed with over the last, I mean, 13 months or so is how so many people immediately just pivoted and we figured out like we knew we needed to stay connected. We knew we needed to continue doing our jobs and so we found ways to do that. And so we took this massive disruption and we turned it into an innovation. And I know I've seen a lot of examples of, of really new, exciting things that have come out of, of the pandemic. Like I mentioned, my teammates and I being able to interact with a lot more students than we would have been otherwise if we were traveling out on the road. And I also had a couple of events pretty recently that, that really showed me just how, how impactful some of these innovations have been. So, I was on a virtual career fair with um, the, a, a group that is like educating people on cooperatives. Um, and so they, they focus on agricultural cooperatives quite a bit. Um, and so they, they reached out to, to National FFA and, and wanted to, to highlight the work that FFA does. Um, and so it was a pretty cool relationship I got to build because I, I did an event for them last November, uh, just a couple of weeks after I was elected. And then they reached out again this spring. Um, they had a couple events focused in the Midwest. And so got to interact there and, and some companies that y'all might be familiar with like Growmark um, were, were also represented there on, on the career fair. And that was something that normally those cooperative career fairs would not be held virtually. Um, and so they wouldn't have built that connection with FFA that they did because of the virtual career fairs. And then there's this picture just last week, I was in Wyoming and their state convention, it was in person, but it was very different than any state convention they'd had before. Normally it would be four days long and they would have all of their competitions there during that week. Um, but this year they, they shifted their competitions and they had some each weekend leading up to convention and they only had a two day convention. And there were so many things that were different about it. And it would have been pretty easy for the state officers, for the state staff there to say that, you know, we're just not even gonna try to have a convention at all. But they, they realized the importance of bringing people together. And so they, they chose to take that disruption, turn it into an innovation, and they built a pretty incredible convention. And just seeing the smiles on those students' faces, getting, me, getting to be together in the same room, even though it was different, it was still really meaningful because they, they put in the work to make it happen and to make a difference. So those are a couple of the places that I've seen where, where people have, you know, they, they, we have an option that when, when disruptions happen, we can refuse to accept that that's what's happening, but that doesn't really help us. Or we can sit back and you know choose to wait until the world gets normal again. But instead, the, the best option is, is to step up and say, well, what can we do? And what's something new that we can build because of it? And the symposium tonight is a great example of that as well. And so I'm, I'm really excited to see how IVCC is continuing to live out this message. And thinking about careers in agriculture, like I mentioned earlier, ag is always being disrupted all the time, whether it's those small things um, day to day or it's bigger macro trends. 
Um, and that's, that's why I'm excited to work in agriculture is because I know there's always going to be new problems to solve. And to me, that's exciting. There's always more to learn and, and there's always ways to, to continue to innovate in, in new ways and to think differently. So for the last few minutes, um, I, I, I really like, I love talking about concepts and ideas, um, but even more important to me is figuring out, well, what do I do with these ideas? And so I just ask each of us to think about, you know, what's, what's a disruption in our lives right now? Like maybe this is something because of the pandemic, or maybe it's something else in, in our lives with relationships or with, you know, trying to decide what to do for a career or where to transfer after finishing an IVCC, whatever those things are, think about, you know, what, what are those aspects in our lives that we're seeing things thrown at us that we didn't expect. And then my challenge is these three, three questions. So we look at that, that disruption, we kind of flip it upside down and look at innovation. So who are we surrounding ourselves with that are going to help us figure out how to innovate in this situation? And then how are we thinking differently about it? A lot of times, I think it's Albert Einstein that has a quote that we don't solve our problems with the same type of thinking that created them. And that's the thing I, I think about a lot that if I'm looking at a problem and I can't seem to find my way out of it, maybe I need to look at it a little bit differently or from a different perspective. And then finally, what, what steps are we going to take to make something positive happen instead of just letting something negative happen? Life is full of disruptions and they're messy and chaotic. And sometimes it takes us a, a few days or a little while to figure out how we're gonna handle it. But once we process what's, 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 what's the state of the world around us, then we can move forward and turn that disruption into an innovation and, and build something new as a result. And I think life, life is interesting because we never quite know what to expect. And every day we get to wake up and, and face a new challenge and a new place to innovate. So with that, um, obviously happy to answer any questions. I've got some contact information here as well. I write a blog um, every Tuesday morning, it comes out and it's kind of started from the idea of embracing complexity, that there's a lot of nuance to the world. Um, and so every week I take what kind of seems like a dichotomy to opposing ideas um, and I seek to, to bring them together and figure out what's the balance between the two of them. Um, so I'm on, on Substack with that. I um, also have my email, Instagram, Twitter, Facebook, um, and, and the address of the FFA Center here. So happy to take any questions and seriously, thank you again for the invitation. This has been so good to be back and to see so many familiar faces. Absolutely. Um, thank you, Miriam. Um, you're truly an inspiration to all of us. Your perseverance and your dedication, uh, you know, to the FFA and to agriculture is just remarkable. And, uh, you know, sticking with it, I, I just, I, I can't get over, you know, going through virtual interviews and, and the virtual process to, um, to get to where you're at today. It's just, it's just remarkable. And, and I commend you for your efforts. And uh, that's why I asked you to talk on this topic. I just think that um, what you've accomplished in these challenging times is, is really remarkable. So thank you for being here tonight. And, and everyone, if you have any questions, feel free to type them in the chat for Miriam. I'm sure she'll be happy to answer anything. All right. Uh, well, with that, I, I'd just like to take a minute to, to thank both of our speakers, Dr. Hudson, for a fantastic job. Uh, Miriam, thank you for joining us. And, and everyone, thank you for being here. Uh, we weren't sure how to go about this. We, we want, we've been wanting to have a symposium actually for a few years now. And we said, you know what, virtual or not, let's get it kicked off and, and get started. So um, thank you for everybody for being here. Yes, and I would love yeah, to. Yeah, I'll turn it over oh, to you. sorry. <laughs> That's okay. Um, I just want to echo everything that Willard said. First of all, Miriam, fantastic job as usual. Thank you for being here with us. And again, to Dr. Hudson, thank you as well. Um, before we close out, actually, um, Allison informed me that they already, her and Taylor actually already tallied up and um, found out who the, the winners were for the, the drawing from the trivia. Um, so Allison, do you want to, I know you said you were having some connection issues, but if you wanted to pop on and announce who the winners are, that would be awesome. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay. I'm not getting a chance turning on my camera. <laughs> so our three doors prize winners were Miriam, Dr. Corcoran and Jane. 
Perfect. Awesome. Um, well, if all of you don't already have IVCC Ag swag, <laughs> we will contact you guys and um, get that taken care of. So um, one last thing before we close, we do just like to highlight our upcoming events. So um, for anyone interested, we do on this Wednesday um, at six o'clock have another virtual event on Zoom with um, Western Illinois University. We are having an Ag College Transfer Night with them. Um, so if you know of anybody interested in IVCC and also interested in transferring to Western Illinois University, um, please send them our way. And again, you can go to ivcc.edu slash agriculture, go to upcoming events, and that's where you'll find that. And also where you can find um, where you can find uh, the recruitment video that we showed at the beginning. So again, thank you all so much for being here. We appreciate you taking the time out of your evenings to spend with us and have a great evening. And we will see you all hopefully in the near future. Wonderful. Thank you so